I'm super excited to be here with you this morning. We're uh, continuing on in our series on the life of Joseph, like TJ said. Um, and to continue on what TJ did, uh, we're going to keep this interactive thing going. So I've got a question for you to kick us off this morning. How many of you have seen Inside Out 2 yet? Yes? Did we like it? Thumbs up? Good? Better than the original? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that sounds like a no. I saw some yet thumbs up, though. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Confession Time have not seen Inside Out 2 yet. Um, but being in student ministry, I have heard, it's all I've heard about for like two weeks from students. Um, they've said it's incredible, one of the best movies of the year, and a, a lot of them have said that it is better than the original is, uh, and, which is a hot take apparently in this room, but that's what they're saying. And the box offices seem to agree, right? Inside Out 2 is it's currently the highest grossing movie of 2024, both in America and all over the world. It's, fun fact, the third highest grossing animated movie of all time. Movie, I know, crazy. I thought that too. It's also the, the highest grossing Pixar movie of all time, which in a world where Finding Nemo exists, shocks me. Um, and it seems like they've done something incredible. They've made a sequel that was better than the original. And they're not the only ones to do this. There have been other movies, sequels that have been better than the original. Uh, Empire Strikes Back is one of those. Godfather 2 did that. The Dark Knight did that, incredible movie. Uh, Shrek 2 did that. If you've never seen Shrek 2, that's your homework today. Go watch that movie after. I Need a Hero by the Fairy Godmother is a banger of a song. It's so good. And we, it's cool because we love nothing more than when actors and writers are able to take a movie that we love so much and improve on it and make it even better in the sequel. There's also sequels that we know that, uh, let's say, did not live up to expectations. <laughs> Uh, did anybody see Grease 2 when it came out? Yes. Horrendous movie. <laughs> Jaws 2 exists, and it's not good. Um, Cars 2, I will say, is probably the worst sequel to ever be put out. Uh, they took a movie about racing and redemption and turned it into a, an international spy thriller starring Larry the Cable Guy. Horrendous sequel. It was not good. And as I was researching this week, there's a ton of writing that's got in, gone into what makes a good sequel versus what makes a bad sequel. Some people say that a sequel needs to have a compelling story, right? That builds on the first one, that takes it to a new level. Some say that there's gotta be like a twist or an, or an innovation on what made the first one so good to take that second one to the next level. I would say for me, what makes a sequel better than the original is good character development. For me, there's something special about when there are characters that I've known and fallen in love with and then in the next movie, I see him go through challenges and I see him grow and change and develop into maybe somebody different than they were in the first movie, but somebody who's better, more well-rounded. Uh, and I think those make good sequels. Good character development makes good sequels because that's relatable for us, right? We all go through difficulty and we would like to think that on the back end of difficulty, we would come out on the other side better, changed, maybe a little different, but, but better than we were before. And the good news for us is that's one of God's specialties. He's in the business of taking us through difficult situations and molding us more into the image of Jesus through them. We've seen that all through the life of Joseph in this series, right? Joseph starts off and he's kind of this annoying younger brother figure. Um, and his brothers, I will say, overreact, but uh, fake his death and sell him into slavery. <laughs> We, we see him go through his situation with Potiphar's wife. He ends up in jail. Um, he thinks he's gonna get out of jail when he meets the cupbearer. And then the cupbearer forgets about him for a couple years. But then through all Joseph goes through, through all the leaning on God, he, he endures and he does. He ends up being second in command of Egypt, right under Pharaoh, just in time for this big famine to save the city. And the Bible tells us that um, Joseph has almost forgotten the troubles of his youth. Says he's made it through, he's in a good spot, and he has forgotten the evils of what happened to him when he was growing up. And then, about 22 years after he was in the well, his brothers roll up on his doorstep. And they're asking for help, and they don't recognize him as the brother they sold into slavery, but they're asking for help, asking for food, and Joseph helps them. He says, okay, I'll give you food, but he says, when you need more food, and you need to come back here, he says, bring your youngest brother. He says, I want to meet him. I want to see him. So the brothers go back and they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. But then they need more food. And so they tell their father, Jacob, they say, hey, this guy, he said, if we need more food, we've got to bring Benjamin. 
And Jacob did not want that to happen, but eventually the need for food gets so bad that he relents. So Benjamin and the brothers go back to Joseph to ask for more food. And Joseph is delighted to see them again, to see the youngest brother. And now he's got a choice to make. He ends up inviting them in, having dinner with them. And before he sends them back to Jacob, he's got one more test for them. And this test that he has for them is kind of the sequel moment to the story that kicked off Joseph's entire plight. And so what Joseph is gonna wanna see in these brothers and what we're gonna see today, have the brothers have any char- had any character development? Have they grown? Have they changed since Joseph saw them 22 years ago? Let's see. Genesis 44 verse one is where we're gonna be today. So we're gonna start and we're gonna go through the whole chapter in, in bits here. So Genesis 44, verse one, it says, then he, Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he, the steward, did exactly as Joseph told him. Here's the setup. Joseph has his steward put the money that the brothers paid for the grain back in their bags of grain. It's the same thing that he did the last time they asked for food. He gave them their money back. But this time there's a twist. He says, hey, take my my silver cup and I want you to put it in Benjamin's bag. This is a cup that the brothers would have recognized. It's a cup that they would immediately clock what it is. They probably saw it at dinner the night before. They may have even heard stories about this cup, which sounds kind of weird, but we'll get there in a second point is they would know it when they saw it. And just like that, the trap is set for what Joseph's about to do. Verse three, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. Real quick, what's up with that divination bit? Uh, There was something in the ancient Near Eastern world called hydromancy. And what that was is that they thought that they could drop things in water, like objects or liquids, and that the ripples that would come out, the patterns that the water would make, they could use to tell the future. And so they thought it was a way to divine the will of the gods of the future. And a silver cup would have been perfect for something like that. Uh, We know that Joseph did not practice divination of any kind or much less hydromancy. Uh, He says in Genesis 40, verse eight, that revelations only come from God. So we know he didn't partake in this, but what this does is it continues the ruse that Joseph is just this Egyptian man, that he's not uh, a Hebrew that they would have known. It also communicates to them the importance of this cup. This is not just like what he drank from. This this had a lot more meaning and impact than just that. So if it was stolen, it was a big deal. Verse six, it says, when he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. The steward said, let it be as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground and each man opened his sack. These brothers are appalled that they're even being accused of this, right? They say, hey, after all that Joseph's done for us, after we saw that the month, our original money was back, we brought it back. They're like, after all the, the right that has gone on here, how could you accuse us of doing something this egregious? There's almost this attitude of like, how dare you say that we would do something like that? And they're so sure they didn't do it. They're like, the cup's not in here. They're so sure they say, hey, if you find the cup in one of these bags, you can kill who has it. And the rest of us will be your servants. And so the guard takes it down a notch, right? He's like, that's a lot. He says, on Joseph's command, no, if we find it, whoever's bag it was in will be a servant, will be a slave. And the rest of you are free to go. This is masterful by Joseph. 
Because remember, 22 years ago, the original crime that took place was about Joseph, who was Rachel's son and Jacob's favorite son, being put up to be sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. Joseph is now brilliantly spinning this situation to where Rachel's new son and Jacob's new favorite, their youngest brother, is gonna be up to be a slave in Egypt again. And Joseph's gonna see, what do they do? Have they changed 22 years later? But the brothers, they don't, they don't see this coming. They're honestly probably not even worried as the, the officer starts to go check their bags. As, as brash as they were about shoving it off, they're like, it'll be fine, it's not here. And you've gotta think, uh, verse 12 says they started with the oldest and they went to the youngest. And so they start with uh, Reuben. And they open Reuben's bag and they look in and they see money again, which I'm sure shocked the brothers. They're like, how's this keep happening? But there's, there's no silver cup. And then they go to Simeon and they open his bag and there's money again, but, but no cup. And they go to Levi and they go to Judah. There's 12 of them. I'm not gonna do the whole thing. But you, you've got to think, as they're going down the line, they're, they're not maybe taking it seriously. They might even start making jokes to each other. They might, the guard opens Dan's bag and they're like, I mean, if it was going to be in anybody's bag, it would have been in Dan's bag. But it's not, so we're good. But you've got to think, as they kept going down the line, and it kept getting closer and closer to the end. You've got to think their hearts might have begun to get a little tighter. Their chests might have got a little tighter and they might have started praying, just don't let it be Benjamin. It can be in anybody's, but just don't let it be in Benjamin's bag. Sure enough, they, they get to the end of the line and they open Benjamin's bag and there's money and there's the cup. Imagine how their hearts must have sank because they know what this means, right? They know Benjamin is gonna have to be a slave to this man and they're gonna have to go home to their father empty handed and their father cannot handle this level of distress, he would, he would pass away. Verse 13 tells us they tore their clothes is how distressed they were. They were so upset by this. And this is the worst possible situation that could happen. And this time it's different because they're not in control. Now they're at the mercy of uh, someone who is far more powerful than they are and somebody who they've wronged in more ways than they're even aware of. The odds are not in their favor here. And so with their heads hanging low, they get back on their donkeys and they go back to the city to go face Joseph. This is a low moment for these guys. And this is exactly where God wants them to be. Because a fact of life is that God uses our challenging circumstances to mold us more into the image of Jesus. And that's exactly what's going on here in this story. It's when we're at the end of our rope a lot of times that God finally begins to get our attention. This situation, that the, this bad situation that the brothers are in is similar to bad situations for us and that bad situations are often an opportunity to wake us up to what God's doing in our lives and in our hearts. Because when we're coasting through life, right, we don't feel the need to change. When things are good, um, it's easy to, to forget or not even notice what God might be doing in our hearts. It's often the difficult moments where God kind of, he shakes us awake and he, he helps us to see ourselves as we really are. He helps us to see reality for what it really is. And he offers us a change. He offers us a way to rethink the way that we've been living. There's a pastor author I really, really love. His name's Tully and Chavichian. And he's got this quote about change. And he says, people don't change until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. God uses difficult moments to show us that the way of life that we've been living isn't working. That we need to be willing to see why, to see reality and to choose a better way. And when these bad situations hit us, a lot of times whatever our first reaction is, that's probably what God's trying to wake us up to. You know, when things fall apart, if, if anger is the first thing that comes up for, for you, God's probably trying to wake you up to the fact that there's anger in your heart. If things fall apart and you just begin to grasp for control and you're like, I'm gonna fight and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure this works out the way I had planned. God may be trying to wake you up to the fact that he's God and you're not. He might wanna remind you of that. 
And when this happens, when we get to these moments, we can either choose to see what God is doing and to follow him in his work, or we can, we can ignore it and, and we can kind of keep the status quo, keep things are as they are. Fighting with everything in me not to make a matrix reference right now to the, here's your choice. That joke didn't land in first service either. But I tried it anyway. <laughs> what I know is that in these moments, God is waking us up to an opportunity to see ourselves rightly and to see our lives rightly. It's the same choice these brothers have. Are they gonna ignore what God's doing and continue on with the way they've been living, with the lies they've been telling? Or are they gonna choose to wake up? Let's see what they do. Verse 14, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there and they fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? Again, just part of that ruse. And Judah says, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Joseph says, far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Here, Judah becomes kind of the spokesman for the brothers. And he knows they've got nowhere to run. They're, they're caught. Judah sees that they all stand guilty before God. He says, God has found out the guilt of your servants, both us and Benjamin who had the cup. And this is a really interesting thing for Judah to say because as far as Judah knows, as far as the brothers know, this, is, this, this bad situation is about Benjamin. Like they haven't done anything wrong. They didn't take the cup. So, but he says here that they're all guilty. He's like, Benjamin's guilty and so are we. Benjamin's guilty for taking the cup and they're guilty for, for what? They're guilty for selling Joseph into slavery all those years ago. And that sounds weird because that thought's not in this passage. But we see it, if you flip back a page, we see it in Genesis 42, 21. Uh, the first time the brothers were here, they got put in jail for a night so they could kind of think about what they were gonna do. And they say this to each other. Genesis 42, 21 says, then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. Judah recognizes that this bad situation that they're in is because of what they did to Joseph. He sees this whole thing as divine punishment by God because of the evil that they committed. But it's interesting because they're not the ones really being punished here. Benjamin is, a guy who had, had nothing to do with what happened 22 years ago, who wasn't even born. So Joseph lays out what's gonna happen. He says, all right, um, Benjamin was caught with the cup. He's gonna stay with me and be my servant. And the rest of you are free to go to your father. And it's almost like he kind of just lobs a ball up in the air. And he's like, what are you gonna do? Ball's in your court. Are they gonna show compassion to their father, loyalty to Benjamin? Or are they gonna let another brother go into slavery? This challenge that Joseph gives the brothers is the same one that we're confronted with often. It's will we follow in the way of Christ or will we double down on our sin? The question is really, will we worship Jesus or will we worship ourselves? We've got this choice in multiple moments of our lives. And the truth is here that bad situations for us are opportunities for obedience. When your child acts up, and you feel that anger welling up inside of you and you wanna react, that's an opportunity for obedience. Maybe that's how your mom or your dad would have responded, but God's good to give us a check in our spirit and go, hey, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna respond in anger? Or are you gonna pause? Are you gonna respond in grace and in love? Maybe there's a moment where you're about to lean into an addiction, right? That thing that you haven't been able to kick for years. That's an opportunity right before. Do you follow Jesus? Do you agree with God about what he says and trust him that his way is right? 
or do you fall to the desires of your heart and your flesh and your will as we so often do? We face these opportunities for obedience every day and every single time God offers us a way out. He invites us into a better way of living, a way that uh, looks like freedom, not like bondage, a way that leads to our flourishing in a way that leads to our safety and our security in a better way of life. We have stories of scripture all over scripture about people who have made this choice for flourishing and we have stories about people who have made this choice towards sin, towards death. And this story with Judah is no different. What's he gonna do? Judah, for the next few verses, this next passage, he, he talks to Joseph and he recaps everything that the brothers have been through. Ironically, he tells Joseph about what happened to Joseph. He says, um, hey, you know, my, my father's favorite son passed away a few years ago. He was eaten by a wolf. My father almost died because of his grief. And now he has this favorite son. And the last time we came here, you told us that we needed to bring him, even though it was against everything my father wanted. And now we're here. And Judah says in verse 30 through 34, now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, Judah, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Judah, in this moment, offers himself in place of Benjamin. He says, hey, I'll stay. I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. Just please let my brother go. This is the character development that we love to see because this Judah who's sacrificing himself for his brother is a far cry from the Judah we saw 10 chapters ago. If you guys remember, the last time that Joseph actually heard Judah's voice was from the bottom of a well when Joseph was pleading for his life, was saying, please let me up, please don't kill me, please don't sell me. It was Judah who said, hey, I think we can make some money off this. It was Judah who said, hey, there's a caravan up the road, let's sell him. Judah's the one who made that call. Judah's kind of the one who put Joseph in all these bad situations for his whole life, kind of his responsibility. But God, through Judah's life, worked on him. And we don't really know how specifically. There are only a few times where Judah's the main, main character in the story in Genesis. We don't know if what made Judah shift and turn towards God was his experience with Tamar in Genesis 38. Uh, I'm not going over that here, but in your free time, if you wanna read that, you're more than welcome to. Um, <laughs> we don't know if it was the guilt that he felt over what he did to Joseph. Uh, we don't know if it was the promise he made to Jacob where he said, I will protect Benjamin. We don't know what made him make that decision in this moment. It could have been all those things that just collapsed on him in that moment to make him sacrifice himself for his brother. But what we do know is that when jo Judah was in this bad situation, when he did not know where to turn, he trusted in God. And I know that's a weird thing to say because we don't really see God explicitly working in this passage. But remember, Judah saw what was happening here as divine punishment for what they did to Joseph. He had kept this lie going for a long, long time. I mean, Jacob still thinks Joseph was eaten by a wolf. They've carried this lie for forever, for 22 years. They probably thought they'd take it to their graves. But now, in this situation where Judah is confronted with the consequences of his sin, he doesn't turn from it. He doesn't lie. He doesn't succumb to that temptation to run and get out. He finally stops running and he accepts reality for what's happening in front of him. And he also makes a decision that finally aligns with God's character. He offers himself in place of his brother. Judah finally sees what God's doing and he trusts it. 
He knows what he's got to do. And he goes from being the guy who said, let's sell our brother to the guy who's willing to sacrifice himself for his brother. When we're stuck in a bad situation, we also have the opportunity to trust God as he molds us into the image of Jesus. Bad situations can be where you're hit with a moment of temptation and you don't know how you're gonna say no or how you're gonna get out of it. It could be where you're in a situation and something that you're really not proud of wells up inside your heart or in your head and now you've gotta own it and deal with it. It could be that a bomb has just gone off in the center of your life and you're figuring out like, how do I pick up the pieces? What is God gonna do with this? In each of those places, especially when life seems hopeless, God is inviting us in to dwell closer with him. And when we reach the end of our rope and we don't have control anymore, that's where we get to throw up our hands and we get to say, God, I need you to be God here because I'm not and I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this thing. And in those moments, we get something better than rescue. We get something better than an escape from our pain. We get Jesus. We get him. He's the prize at the end of the road. When you don't know how you're gonna make it to tomorrow, you have a God to hold on to you because of Jesus. When you don't know how you're gonna keep it together, if one more thing happens that's gonna push you over the edge, God is there with you in that difficulty. Even harder, when, when you're confronted with the reality of your own sin and you see it and you think, how could God love somebody like me who thinks the things that I think, who feels the things that I feel, you get to look at the cross and remember that you're exactly who Jesus died for and that he'll never go back on his word. Judah makes this sacrifice for his brother, Benjamin. And Judah's gonna go on, he's gonna do a lot of cool things. And one of those things is that he's gonna be the leader of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And thousands of years later, there's gonna be a baby born in Bethlehem who's a direct descendant of the line of Judah who's born. And his name is Jesus. And they're gonna call him the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't get me wrong, Judah's sacrifice, it was brave, it was heroic to give his life for Benjamin. It was incredible character development, but it was not the end. Judah's sacrifice is a shadow of a much greater sacrifice. And Jesus looks at us now, who unlike Benjamin, are actually guilty. And he says, I'm gonna give myself in your place so that I can call you a brother and so that I can call you a sister. And now when we're in a bad situation, we don't have to see it as divine punishment because the divine punishment that we earned was placed totally and completely by Jesus on the cross. The bad situations that we go through that happen in our lives are not divine punishment. God doesn't throw hurricanes and tornadoes into our lives as some sort of divine retribution for our bad behavior. If you've trusted in Jesus, God's not mad at you, period. Jesus took all of it on for us, all of it. And now he offers us a hope and a future and he offers us a way of life that's not based on our obedience. He offers us a way of life that's based completely on his obedience. And so when we're confronted by our own sin, when our world is spinning, when everything seems hopeless, we get to look to the one who's in control and he'll hold our hand through this storm of life. And he tells us that our bad situations are for our good, even if we can't see it. And even if uh, they don't go according to our plans for what we had envisioned for our lives. This was us at camp this past week. Um, we, we do a late night event at camp every day uh, at 10.30 at night, which is too late um, <laughs> for me, not for our students. And the last night we had planned to do a worship night out by the lake at Glorietta, which is more of a pond, but out there. And they have like a beach area. And we had planned to do like 30 minutes of worship and communion and then split them into their small groups. And as we're setting up for this camp or this, this worship night on the beach, it starts pouring rain. So like tons of rain, thunder, lightning, kind of like what we just heard. It was, it was a lot. And so we very quickly packed up. And by we, I mean TJ. 
And TJ packed up very quickly. We brought it inside and we were scrambling for like, what's next? We're like, what do we do? How do we save this? And we decided to do a worship night inside. We're like, we'll just move it in. We'll do worship in the round. Um, and if I'm being honest with you guys, I was bummed. Like, I was like, this is not gonna, this is not gonna be as, as good as we planned, as fun as we planned, but like, I guess it'll be okay. And as we were singing, we had planned to just be 30 minutes communion and then and we'd call it a night. Um, but as we were singing and as we took communion, if I'm honest with you guys, uh, I got really emotional uh, about Pike because it had been a year almost to the day previously that he had been diagnosed with cancer. And I looked around and the majority of our students were feeling the same thing. And what I thought would be about a quick 30 minute set to put a pin at the end of camp turned into an hour and a half, hour 15 minutes of the most beautiful time of worshiping Jesus that I've ever been a part of. Students were falling on their face in front of Jesus and we were holding our grief and our joy and our hope and our pain and just bringing it to the foot of the cross. And there are people now, we have new brothers and sisters that we're gonna see in heaven because of what happened that night and because of what Jesus did. Had things gone according to my plan, I don't think we would have had the experience that we had. We couldn't have done it outside. And my plan for the night was basically s'mores. And God took a plan that I had and he brought rain and he had a shift so that he could do something that none of us ever planned for him to do and couldn't have planned for him to do in our, our wildest dreams. What's wild is that in the brother's bad situation here, God does something very similar because this bad situation, this, uh, what they thought was the worst thing that could have possibly happened is actually God's grace to them. As a result of this story of what's happening, their entire family, their entire bloodline is gonna be saved from this famine that's wrecking the world. They are going to be reunited with their long lost brother and they're finally gonna be freed from the guilt and the shame that they've been carrying from this lie for 22 years. Paul Tripp uh, is an author and a theologian and he talks about, has this quote about the kingdom of God that I love. He says, the good news of the kingdom is not freedom from hardship, suffering and loss. It is the news of a redeemer who has come to rescue me from myself. That's true for us and that's true for Joseph's brothers. God saved them from themselves. And these men who are, if you read the story, are murderers and thieves and human traffickers are gonna become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it has nothing to do with their behavior. It doesn't even have anything to do with their turn back towards God. It has everything to do with how God takes broken people and uses them to accomplish his purposes for the world. Spoiler alert here, but next week, what they intended for evil, God intended for good. And that's the sequel to the story of Joseph being sold into slavery. And I hate to, to leave you on a cliffhanger here, but we're not gonna finish uh, today. <laughs> There's clearly more to the story and we're gonna get to see Joseph's response next week. But the sequel of our story is that one day Jesus is gonna come back and he is going to make this world right. He's gonna make everything new again, including us. He's gonna heal us completely and he's gonna change our hearts into something unrecognizable from what they were before. He's gonna glorify us and we'll look like he does. We'll look perfect and holy and blameless. But until that day, we get to praise God that he already sees us that way. He's worthy of our worship. And so I'm gonna pray and then let's continue to worship him and thank him for saving us and for giving us himself. Lord Jesus, we love you more than we could say. God, thank you for giving us stories like this, shadows that we can look to to see fully and more clearly what your son did for us on the cross. God, we could not be more grateful for you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rescuing us. And thank you for loving us enough to meet us where we are in our sin, but to love us too much to let us stay that way. 
Thank you that you are continuing to work in our lives. And now we get to obey you, God, not out of earning your love, but because we already have it. And that when we succeed or when we fail, God, we can look to you and know that you are our loving father who does not see us any differently either way. Thank you that you already love us as much as you possibly could and that we can find rest in that. Lord, we love you. Amen.